Can everyone hear me okay? Well, cool, I don't get to use a microphone very often. This is fun. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Lorne. I use he and pronouns. I'm the volunteer and education coordinator for the Green Mountain Club. It's really great to have you joining us here at the Brooks Memorial Library. Um, for those of you that are looking for seating, there's still some around here. Also, going up top on the fancy balcony is acceptable as well. Um, maybe encouraged. I might go up there when I'm done here. Um, so, Green Mountain Club is hosting this, uh, or, or in partnership with the library, is hosting this event tonight. The Green Mountain Club, uh, you all are here, you might know a little bit of what it is, but I'll give a quick overview of what our organization does. We were founded in 1910 with the purpose of creating and uh, maintaining the Long Trail in the state of Vermont. Long Trail is a long distance hiking trail that goes from the Massachusetts border north to the Canadian border. Uh, Green Mountain Club finished the Long Trail in 1931, and I like to joke that we've been fixing all of our mistakes ever since then. Uh, we built trails really differently back in 1930 than we do now in the 2020. Um, and so to do that, we have a full-time staff of about 15 full-time year-round people. Uh, we have an annual seasonal staff of about 40 people, including our caretakers and trail crew who do a lot of work on the ground, and then over a thousand annual volunteers that contribute to the trail maintenance and conservation efforts of the GMC. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, GMC has a headquarters up in Waterbury Center, but we work up and down the entire state of Vermont. There's lots of great ways to get involved as a volunteer, or lots of great ways to get involved um, and learn uh, and get educated and go out and join the Green Mountain Club on hikes. We have sections throughout the entire state of Vermont that host guided hikes, uh, trail work opportunities, um, map and compass classes, and then a wonderful speaker series that we host throughout the winter. I think I have another slide that I'm supposed to go to that might have explained all of that. There we go. Um, there we go, Tra trail maintenance, <laughs> conservation, community outreach, and education. I'm also going to thank our sponsor for the evening, which is 802 Cars. You might not think of a hiking club as requiring lots of vehicles, but when you have 40 seasonal staff that work all over the state of Vermont that have to drive there and you have to move lumber and uh, bark mulch and tools and equipment and all that kind of stuff, we have a pretty big fleet of vehicles and 802 supports us every year by donating three or four cars uh, for our usage. Um, so it's really great to have their support uh, for this speaker series. The next thing I'll say is about this speaker series. GMC has been doing this for the last 31 years, kind of with the intention of getting people, uh, getting people out of their homes during the middle of winter, reminding them of what type of inspiring adventures might exist. We've hosted talks um, on everything from, you know, just hiking the Long Trail to going and hiking Mount Everest. Um, uh, so trying to inspire people to get out during the winter time and stay engaged and know that the club can kind of support them in doing that. It's really a great pleasure to host Spencer uh, this evening. I think I met Spencer probably right around three years ago at a presentation up at GMC. We didn't really know what to expect um, with his presentation and I was, was, was very, very pleasantly surprised and really excited to be able to come down to Brattleboro, get on the road a little bit, um, and have an in-person presentation down here with Spencer. I remember when we first talked about him presenting this, I have a hill behind my house that I thought was this kind of podunk little hill. I was like, hold on, Spencer's hiking 500 peaks? Did he hike that hill behind my house? And, you know, what do you know? He did. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I'm really excited to hear his story. Um, and uh, thanks again, Spencer. I don't need this microphone. Anyone who knows me knows we're gonna have like a noise violation about five minutes from like over in New Hampshire because of me talking so loud, but I'll, I'll try the mic. Uh, so hey, thanks a lot for coming out. There's a lot of people here, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for being here. Um, absolutely. So um, I'm an Instagram influencer. Uh, I am a swimsuit model. I'm sponsored by the Kardashians. Uh, and uh, you know, I have a big social media. No, I'm one of the only people under 50 who's never been on social media. Um, and I'm not saying that social media is like an entirely bad thing. There's definitely 
a, a, a part of that pie that is uh, a positive thing and productive. But I'm really concerned that people and society is going down that rabbit hole so much to the point of something that's very destructive. And I'm talking about bullying and narcissism and forgetting about what's out there. Like, what does the tree look like? And so when it gets to the point where it's this pettiness and roughness and spending hours upon hours in a virtual world to supplant the natural world, especially the beautiful natural world in which we are very fortunate to live in the Northeast here, uh, I think it's uh, it, it very problematic and incredibly destructive. And so my message, my overall message is to try to leave cyberspace and get outside. I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not saying if you do social media, that's like a bad thing. There definitely can be some positive manifestations and some good things that happen for sure. Absolutely. But a lot of times it's not and it's so excessive. And so uh, I just, uh, you know, really encourage people to connect with the outside and with the wilderness and all that it has to offer for your own mental health and physical health and emotional health. I think it's so important. And so I'm actually not an Instagram influencer. I am a sugar maker. I'm a ninth generation Vermonter. Uh, I am a local attorney. And I also run a website <clears throat> called the Vermont110.com. So the Vermont110.com is the 110 mountains above 3,000 feet in the state of Vermont, and it's a resource for people who want to climb those 110 mountains <clears throat> above 3,000 feet in the state of Vermont. Uh, so that's uh, the Vermont110.com, I run that website. So um, how, did, how did I get like here? Uh, growing up, I, was, I tried like all these sports. I, I tried almost every like traditional competitive sports, sport, and like I was so, wildly bad at all of them. I mean, I was like an embarrassment to the sports community and athletes everywhere. Like, like I'd be like not allowed in Planet Fitness, I'm sure, hypothetically. I would be like kicked out of the Olympics. It's like, I, I'm a, it's, a, it's a total disaster. Me and sports, organized sports, like just never got along. And like the problem is like with organized sports, I couldn't, I couldn't color within the lines. There's all these like, okay, here's the rules, here's what you have to do, here's like the regulations and stuff. And like, I would always just like not be able to color within those lines. So organized sports didn't agree with me at all. Like I play tennis and I'd be like, just trying to get home runs. I'm like, yeah, man, I'm gonna hit the ball into Rhode Island or something. And that was tennis to me. And I played hockey and oh man, like I mean, people would be like, I play organized sports, and there'd be like people like they'd be like, "What was that?" Oh, you know, it, it was just, it was amusing. I guess I, I play hockey, and I remember during the middle of the games, I'm being really young. In the middle of the game, in the middle of the ice, I just skate as fast as I could and flop on the ice in the middle of a game, and just see how far I could slide on my belly. Like, how far can I go on my belly? And like, that was my mindset of like what to do in like sports, and so. Yeah, it was uh, like severely terrible. And so, uh, you know, so I, I never also, I gravitated to hiking because it's not a competitive sport. Uh, it's not something that is uh, uh, competitive. It's um, something that is, uh, uh, there's where you kind of do it on your own terms. I never kind of, I never like jived with the, uh, it was, just wasn't in my mindset of like, well, there's gonna be a winner and there's gonna be a loser. Like we gotta we got crush the other team. I'm not like competitive in nature. That's just not, and I'm not knocking anyone who likes organized sports, like that's totally fine, but I'm just saying how I got here and not, you know, being like involved with them, like, uh, and whatnot. So I gravitated more towards like hiking. And so how I got started was um, basically back in uh, 2008, I decided to hike the long trail. So I, um, uh, I, did the, I did the long trail in sections, and I did it over the course of several years. I uh, started in 2008, and one time during the long trail, uh, I was hiking up by Bromley. 
And so I'm hiking on the long shot by Bromley, and all of a sudden this person comes out of the woods, uh, like, at, 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 like just out of the deep woods in the middle of nowhere. And it looked like, the guy looked like he'd been like lost at sea, like in like shanty stuff. It was like the swamp Gila monster or something like that. He was all dirty, and he had like bugs in his hair and pine cones and stuff. And I was like hiking the launch, I'm like, whoa, are you okay? Do you need like some assistance? Do you, maybe you need, you know, do, do I need to like call for help? What's going on? Because this, this was, it was like he was from like the Pleistocene epoch, like some lost being or something. And and uh, he said, no, I've been out bushwhacking all day. And I was like, what's bushwhacking? He's like, well, this is where you just like hike off trail and you go to the uh, uh, tops of different mountains and, uh, in, and there's no trail. And I'm like, how do you find your way? I was, he's like, well, well, I have a compass. And, and, and I'm like, you mean there's no trail? And he's like, yeah, I, I do it all the time. I just, I'm about to go do Mount Tabor. And this was the first I ever heard of. I always thought it was like regimented, kind of like, you know, you hike on the trail. But he introduced me to this thing called this, you know, Bigfoot, like Sasquatch dude came out of the woods, like introduced me to like the idea of like, yeah, you can just, uh, on public land and stuff, you can just go and, and climb to the top of various mountains and bushwhack up there. And the freedom in that was really appealing to me. I was like, that's so cool. And you could just explore. And he was going all these mountains that not many people had been to. And so it was, I should, instead of saying it was all downhill from there, I should say it was all uphill from there. Because <laughs> after that, like that was it. I was just like, totally hooked to start doing this like bushwhacking and stuff. So over the next couple of years, I hiked all uh, 110 mountains uh, in the state of Vermont above 3,000 feet uh, in 2010, 11, and 12 uh, using a map and compass, uh, hiking those, uh, those peaks. And then it was just a case of like one thing leads to another leads to another. And I then after that, I hiked all the 4,000 footers, there's 115 4,000 footers in the Northeast uh, between New York and New Hampshire, Maine, et cetera, and, uh, and Vermont. And uh, there's a total of 115, I hiked all those. So after that, I was like, well, what do we do next? You know, I'm always looking for stuff and like, I was always really high energy and stuff and I always, you know, I'm never bored, I always try to think of something to do. And so I heard about this thing called the 770. And so somebody told, some bushwhacker told me about the 770 that somebody had done, climbed all 770 mountains above 3,000 feet in the Northeast United States. I was like, 770, that would take like forever. I was like, that's ridiculous. That would take like a lifetime. Like, how do you do that? And it took the first person who did all 770, it took him 16 years to accomplish uh, climbing all 770. So I've naturally, kind of like the hockey belly flop, I've always been attracted to bad ideas and <laughs> nonsense and ridiculousness. I'm like, bad idea, nonsense, ridiculous, that's natural ally for me. <laughs> me and those things go together awesome. So I was like, well, that sounds ridiculous. I'll try to climb the 770. And so for the next eight years, every single weekend, except for certain winter weekends, I traveled around and it was ridiculous. I was just telling someone here, like, I go get an oil change on Friday, and then my mechanic would be like, okay, I'll see you on Monday for the next 3,000 miles. Because, like, I just drive so much to get to these other, uh, uh, these mountains. But I climbed the 770 and finished in 2020. After eight years, I became the 12th finisher of the 770. And the first person from Vermont uh, to, to, to finish it. And uh, so then around that time too, I was working on stuff in the winter. And I said, what about trying to ski all 110 mountains above 3,000 feet? You know, no one's ever done that. Sounds like a bad idea. Let's do it. And so like, I then decided to go and I worked for a bunch of winters to ski all 110 mountains going from the summit down to a trailer road, only ever removing my skis for unskiable uh, terrain, like some kind of like, uh, gully or like troll under a bridge monster something like that <laughs> and I finished that in 20 I didn't intend it that way but I finished skiing all 110 mountains in Vermont becoming the first person to do so wow. and so I've ended up setting three records the 770 the first person from Vermont to hike the 770 the first person to ski all 110 mountains above 3,000 feet and I have the record for most visits to Top of the Hill Grill up there. I visited 150 times in one season. I have the world undisputed, undefeated Top of the Hill Grill world championship record. And honestly, that's the only one that's important, is, that, is the Top of the Hill Grill, because 
because you'll never beat me in an eating contest. I will destroy any of you. If any of you want to wait after the show, we'll go get some pizza. If you want to try to uh, see if you could beat me in an eating contest or something like that, you will fail spectacularly. And I will defeat you and solve it. So, yeah, so that's the, that's the third one, Top of the Hill Grill. Um, so then after all that, it was like, okly dokly do, what do we do next? And so I love Vermont. I'm a ninth generation Vermonter. And I uh, absolutely love Vermont. And so I, uh, I, I love exploring around here. And I, I wanted to just get as much of Vermont as I possibly could. So I'd already hiked a number of the Vermont 500 highest. So I decided to try to climb the Vermont 500 highest mountains. And those 500 highest mountains go from 4,393 feet down to 1,710 10, 1, feet, a uh, little mountain up in Hinesburg. So from Mount Mansfield down to 1,710. And uh, so we'll start off on our slideshow here. Uh, and that's what I worked on after the 770. And it was quite an experience. Um, I basically live on these, I'm on, I just, I'm always looking at maps and I am on these websites uh, all the time. One is called Lists of John. And what Lists of John has done is created software that will, uh, uh, will, will put all the peaks in a given area, you type in a geographic location, and it will put little pins on a map as to what, where all the peaks are. And you can do any state, anywhere in the United States. And so for Vermont, you type in for the Vermont 500 highest list, and here it is on Lists of John. And the, it's a lot longer, that's just the first page. It goes on and on and on for the 500 highest um, in Vermont. And so that was like a template guide for uh, you know, what I worked off for years to try to hike the Vermont 500 highest. The uh, next website that I absolutely love and am on all the time, I don't do any actual work at work, I just am on these websites. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? It's like, like, I'm at my mom and my desk, but really, I'm on these websites trying to figure out how to get to the next mountain. And so I just kind of, you know, it's a good thing. So, uh, so when I'm not working at all, I'm on these websites. And, and uh, this is uh, peakbagger.com. And peakbagger is a great resource because it has topographic maps. So here's Round Mountain in West Broadville. Round Mountain is awesome, and I encourage you, any of you who haven't cl climbed it, to climb Round Mountain. I love it. It's right in Brattleboro. I, I was born in West Brattleboro. I live in West Brattleboro. I like, didn't go anywhere. I, I, I like, bought the house like 10 feet from where I was born, literally. And like, uh, I, uh, I just, hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I love it here, and Round Mountain is part of that. And so Round Mountain's 1,500 feet. Don't listen to Lisa John. I believe it's 1,500 feet. I don't care. It's 1,500 feet, and it's got a beautiful view to the east, and then Lisa John will show you a little circle on the map so you can find it. And that is just an awesome mountain peak resource. Lisa John and peakbagger.com. Spend your work day on those two. And, or, or, or don't go to, and, and uh, they're just uh, excellent. You know, so that is what I worked off for the Vermont uh, 500 highest. Okay, so I want to talk about, um, so here's my wife in Bristol. So many of these mounts, they don't even have a name, you know, and they just go, like, like the only name that you go on with them is like whatever the elevation is. So peak 1,910, peak 2,576, peak 3,008, because they just don't, they've never been named. And this is one of them. It's informally called Bristol Cliffs, but this is peak 1825 in Bristol, Vermont. And one of the things I wanted to talk about tonight are these gems. They're just awesome that Vermont, we all know a, a lot, most of us know about Camel's Hump, and we know about Stratton and Mount Mansfield and the usual suspects for hiking in the long trail. And that's all awesome, but that's not all that's awesome. There's so many other great mountains in Vermont off the beaten path or no path that are just gems. And that's what I wanted to share with you, some of these gems tonight. This is Bristol Cliffs. There's my wife staying up there. She's about to get on a squirrel suit and just swoop down and she'll have a Superman <laughs> thing on and then she'll like uh, kill a bunch of bad guys. And, but this was taken before that. And so she's on the top of, the, uh, 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 you know, of Bristol Cliffs and you have beautiful views, almost 360 degrees. And there's all these crazy rock structures and like 
there was um in, in wildlife like lots of birds like peregrines it's probably like extinct birds and like dodo bird and stuff like that and like a, a spotted speckled warbler or whatever that like nests on the cliffs and and uh it's a really interesting mountain it was just beautiful and this is 1825 feet and it's a gem the views are tremendous wow. uh and just really interesting rock structures uh informally known as bristol cliffs right towering above the town of Bristol, Vermont. Uh, it's just awesome. Um, so here's an unusual. Oh, I got this pointer, and I and so <laughs> and I wish it like worked better so I could like I don't know stop traffic with it. But like uh, like so this here is a, from a mountain, uh, an unnamed mountain near Herrick Mountain in West Rutland near Castleton, and so there just happened to be this clearing, and you could see. All these um, uh, majestic, huge mountains. There's uh, Pico, Killington, Menden, and Shrewsbury. Mm. So you have the beautiful massif from an unusual perspective. And as I sat there, I said to myself, I said, this is so cool because, you know, hardly anyone ever goes to this mountain or nobody. And here I am, I found this clearing. and got this amazing view. And that shot, that perspective is a angle of those peaks and of Vermont that nobody ever really gets and like that was like one of the most rewarding things about doing this is just taking that in and being like hey this right here this angle this perspective is something that you just don't you don't get uh, very often and it was just so beautiful wow. all right <laughs> look at this so the most common and roy back there may dispute me on this but in my opinion the most common names for mountains in the Northeast are bald, bare, blue, spruce, and round. I'm not saying if it's a hill, but you got a lot of those mountains. My mom's always like, tell me where you're going. I'm gonna call rescue. Write down where you're going. Draw me a map. And I always tell her, I'm like, I'm gonna hike round mountain. She's like, again? And I'm gonna go and hike bare mountain. She's like, again? I'm like, no, there's 500, 3,000, whatever, you know, bare mountains. And, and so she's just like, so I can just imagine her notepad at home. It's just like round mountain, round mountain, bare mountain, bare mountain. And so this is Hogback Mountain, which is another extremely common name, but up in Goshen, not the Hogback Mountain out that way in Marlboro and Wilmington. This is Hogback Mountain in Goshen, and it is just surreal. There's Goshen Mountain uh, in the background. That's a mountain called Cape Lookoff Mountain, which is on the Long Trail. And this is a blueberry meadow off of Hogback Mountain that was just stunning. Like the colors, everything was absolutely beautiful. And uh, I just took that picture that day and I just like, wow, look at these colors in the field. And that's not, you know, there's just nothing there. It's all natural uh, and such a beautiful place. This is way up in the Northeast Kingdom. This is in the town of Morgan, Vermont. So this is Elon Hill, which is above Seymour Lake in Morgan, Vermont. You're like very close to Canada at this point. I mean, Canada's like right there, you know? So Canada's super close. And they just hiked Elon Hill, which was on the Vermont 500 highest list. There's this beautiful view over Lake Seymour. And Elon Hill was really cool because it's very prominent up in Morgan. It's, it looks like this haystack. It looks like this like arrow going up. And it's very classic mountain shape. And uh, again, so beautiful up in, uh, you know, right near Canada. I was, uh, you know, I never knew about that. It was really cool. This is an area of Vermont I encourage anyone, uh, if possible, to check out. This is the Groton State Forest. So this is a Little Deer Mountain in Groton, Vermont. And I climbed up here. It's not a very big mountain. Beautiful views off Little Deer Mountain. And the Groton State Forest is just phenomenal. It's north of White River Junction. It's sort of like uh, southwest of St. Johnsbury, kind of between Montpelier and the Connecticut River. And there's like, there were like so many peaks on the Groton State Forest on the Vermont 500 highest list. I was like up there for like a month, like just like, it's like, I don't know what the glacier is, like boom, 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 like mountains <laughs> everywhere. So many mountains, there's an unusual density of mountains and all of them are awesome. All of them were tremendous. It's interesting in the Groton State Forest because uh, there's tons of, uh, this picture doesn't show up, but there's tons of conifers at low elevation. Uh, you get tons of spruce and fir trees at uh, quite low elevation, very dense. And that's what my understanding is, uh, is left over from like the last ice age, from the alpine uh, forest at the very tops 
of the mountains and it just happened in Grand State Forest that that's left over and you, you uniquely find spruce and fir trees at lower elevations and they're very, very dense, the boreal forest. And Grand State Forest has view after view and uh, it's a, it's, again, it's a place in Vermont that is not the usual suspects. Again, I'm not knocking, I mean, Camel Sump is amazing, Long Trail is so awesome. You know, but there's other places too, and that's what I want to you know, spread the word about. Hey, Groton State Forest, that's not on the long show. That's not one of the typical places, but it is a wonderful place uh, to visit. And yes, there are a bunch of trails there too, so you don't have to maniac bushwhack out like me, but you can actually do a trail. Um, this is from the cliff on uh, Jobs Mount or Job's Mount. I don't do pronunciations, I just hike them. Like, I don't know what the proper pronoun, I don't know how to talk, but. I do know how to climb, and like this is Jobs Mountain. Uh, I'm not sure if that's how you pronounce it. Way up in Westmore, and the whole thing is like one enormous cliff, and uh, and uh, like uh, you just I went towards the edge, not too close to the edge though. Mom's was like, "Don't go near the edge of the cliff." And she thinks I'm just gonna like, dangle off the cliff, like it's Niagara Falls, or and I'm like, "No, don't worry, I'm not going too close to the cliff." But I went up to the cliff because I want to check out the view, and so. <laughs> Uh, so a reasonable safe distance from the cliff and it was like beautiful views from Jobs Mountain like up in Westmore Vermont just absolutely gorgeous like you could see uh, uh, like yeah. such a long distance and I had no idea such a great mountain way up in Westmore Vermont Ooh. now this is another gem area I wanted to talk to you all about along with the Groton State Forest uh, this is the Lake Willoughby area and uh, how many of you all are familiar with the Lake Willoughby, Lake Willoughby area? It's up near Newark, Vermont. How many people knew we had a Newark, Vermont? And guess what? It's a little different than Newark, New Jersey. It's a little different. It's not the same as Newark, New Jersey. It's a little different. Than, but it's right next to Newark, Vermont, Lake Willoughby, uh, in that area of the Northeast Kingdom there. And, uh, and there, again, it's like the Groton State Forest, just like poo, 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 mountains everywhere. With, and they all seem to have incredible views. This is Wheeler Mountain. It had a trail, it was a, a short, uh, not a very long climb, but just an incredible precipice and rocks and geologic formation. I mean, you could see, like, look at, Ooh. Ma, close your eyes. Cover your eyes. Okay, all right, so you go up to the cliffs, and you're, and, and, and there'd be like beautiful, like absolutely beautiful, like, I mean, look how big that cliff is. I mean, just crazy cliffs and interesting geologic formations. And then you can just see so far. I mean, I can't recommend Wheeler Mountain enough. And I just think of these views where you're so, you can see like such a, a like grand distance. And I'm like, why did they need to send a Chinese spy balloon? You could just walk to the top of the mountain and get all the surveillance data you needed. You could see further than a balloon. You didn't need to send a balloon. Just go off to the top of Wheeler Mountain, look as far as you can, you can see everywhere, and that's all you need to do. You never get caught, never get shot down, go to the top of Wheeler Mountain. Look at that sunset right there. I just didn't want to leave. I was like, I'm gonna make Wheeler Mountain my home. I'll just kind of stay up here, have a cabin, and just kind of never leave. Because when you're up there like that, it's, it's just magical. And, yeah. and I, I felt so blessed to be able to see a sunset like that. It's so uh, rejuvenating and, uh, and fulfilling. Oh, let's talk about some of the rough ones. So this is Bald Mountain. Again, the millionth Bald Mountain in, in 90 square miles. You know, it's like... The Ball Mountain, this one's up by Faston, Vermont, near Waitsfield, Sugarbush area. Ball Mountain has incredible views. I wish it would have been like a bit of a nicer day, but you can just see like all the peaks and the outline that, you know, the, the, of the vistas there, which was absolutely incredible. And Ball Mountain was such a hard bushwhack. I couldn't believe it. So there's no trail. I just have to figure out how to get up there, uh, you know, going through the woods. And it's just like prison bars of conifers. Like, I think of my cat when I'm bushwhacking. My cat is like 25, and actually my cat is almost 20. Oh. And the cat, its hair is like kind of just gotten so tangled and snarled. It's just like one giant clump from like a Looney Tunes cartoon. And that's, like, and that's what the woods can be like. It's just like my cat's clumps. And, and you gotta try to get through those cat clumps. And how are you going to get through those cat clumps without like, and you, you, know, you got to wear eye protection. And I always like turn my clothes into like a shag rug. 
Like, my mother-in-law would sew my clothes. She sewed my clothes for the past 10 years that I've, like, turned into a shag rug. And she finally, like, threw down some alka salsa. She's like, I can't do it anymore. I can't. She was, like, so, like, stricken. She's like, I can't sew your clothes anymore. I can't do it. She was, like, forlorn and just, like, like exasperated at how much I destroyed my clothes. And that's the th what will happen with bushwhacking. It's a labor of love, but, hey, it leads to something beautiful, Bald Mountain. And uh, so that was really tough. Uh, lots of cliffs, really hard to go, uh, to go up, uh, but absolutely rewarding. Bald Mountain up near Faston and Waitsfield, Vermont. Oh. So a lot of people ask me, what's the toughest mountain in Vermont? What, what, what do you think is the toughest mountain in Vermont? And the toughest area uh, in the Northeast is certainly like almost universally recognized to be the Adirondacks. The Adirondacks are like three, notches hard, harder than anything, in my opinion, in the Northeast. Not to say the Presidential Range in New Hampshire or Baxter State Park in Maine doesn't pack a punch. Those are hard, but Baxter, uh, but the Adirondacks have a unique level of being unsurpassed in awfulness. And, but the hardest, uh, the hardest mountain in Vermont, I would say, in my humble opinion, uh, is East Seneca. And East Seneca Mountain is in the town of Ferdinand, Vermont, which is not a town. So there's four towns in Vermont that had so few people, the state government was just like, nope, not gonna be a town anymore. You're done, you didn't get anyone to live here. Heck with you, you're not a town, you're unincorporated. And they did that in the 1930s. They unincorporated four towns. Ferdinand, Lewis, Vermont, and then we were very lucky in the southern part of the state to have two towns unincorporated, Glastonbury and Somerset, way out where the buses don't run. No Bed Bath & Beyond, no KFC Taco Bell drive through nothing. There's just, nobody lives there, barely. And Ferdinand is incredibly remote. Seneca Mountain is in it. And it's like the area that time forgot. And Seneca is just all so wild and beautiful. And so the only way to get to East Seneca, the only like logical way, unless you get dropped from the Chinese spy balloon, is to go over Seneca Mountain. So you've got to go over Seneca Mountain, way out to Seneca Mountain, go over down the back, and then go all the way out to East Seneca. And that's the only way that, I mean, there's other ways you could do it, but that's the most plausible and realistic way. You have to go over a whole other mountain. So it's so remote, there's no access. And then there's a catch, Seneca, East Seneca Mountain. East Seneca Mountain has dun, 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 the East Seneca Swamp. And you have to cross the East Seneca Swamp, and that's what this is. And you wanna talk about unsurpassed and awfulness, it's like that, I mean, you will travel slower than like an insect trapped in amber <laughs> trying to go through like forest like this and it's just uh you know you're going like a quarter mile of an hour you know and 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 like uh it, it's so slow but you just got to have patience it's not for everybody and you can get to east seneca so for those of you who might wonder in my opinion other people might have a different opinion i think east seneca in ferdinand vermont the town of time forgot is the toughest mountain in vermont just because it's uh so far out there i mean this was uh, actually in the Adirondacks. This is an example of bushwhacking. This was going to McDonald Mountain in the Adirondacks, which is excruciatingly thick. So you have to wear uh, you have to wear uh, glasses. You'll you'll be like you will lose your eyesight. You will you very much damage your eyes. You have to otherwise you get a cornea abrasion, and uh, or worse. It's you have to wear protection, no, and you have to wear long sleeves. It doesn't matter how hot it is and there's no trail, and this took forever. McDonald Mountain is actually, in my opinion, from the 770, the hardest mountain in the entire northeastern United States. It, it took forever to get there, and you're going at just, like, the, the space that, you're going at, like, the pace that it takes a tree to grow. You know, it's just, like, so, like, un, like, wildly slow and and you just got to have that patience to bushwhack through when there's no trail and navigate there and uh yeah that one that that left them that will leave scars uh but that was to get to mcdonald mountain um i want to talk a little bit uh uh let's see did i have one from here well actually let me go back to this um uh one of the things about, um, yeah, you gotta have uh, safety gear. I always put safety very important because I, I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, if I'm dead, it's gonna be a lot harder to hike any more mountains. And so 
I said, you got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them. And I've folded it many times. I said, no, the weather is way too bad. I'm, 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 we're, we're getting out of here. And, you know, that Adirondacks might be, in my opinion, the hardest, but nowhere is the weather worse than the Mount Washington area. I remember my wife and I, it was 14 degrees on July 5th. And I remember because it was the day after July 4th. And it was 14 degrees, and we were not prepared for that insane weather in the middle of the summer. And we got out of there. We're like, no, we're not going to go forward. So you have to know when to quit. And we totally do quit. Uh, uh, um, and, and that's okay. The, you know, the, the worst thing that happens is, is you got to spend a day out in nature, and that's a beautiful thing. Even if you don't make the summit, who cares? It's more important to be safe. I bring a satellite phone. I tell people, I tell my mom like 50 times where I'm going, tell people, give them a, a track log or a map or like a track route of where I'm going. And I bring a huge amount of safety gear. And uh, definitely when you're bushwhacking, you gotta bring uh, uh, glasses. Um, one of the things with the Vermont 500 highest is, at the lower you go, the more private property becomes an issue. And, uh, I'm very grateful that in Vermont, there's, a, you know, for the 500 mountains I did, very, very few private property off limits, uh, don't go here, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre type situation, you know, it's like very few, like, oh, you don't want to go. It was, you know, there was some private property. You know what I find myself doing is sometimes people will put their number on the posted sides and I'll call them from like the stone wall. And I'll just be like, you know, hey, may I get permission to, I just want to go to the top of the mountain that you own. And 99% of the time when they find out that you're just a nature lover, they find out that you're just a hiker, you're not like four-wheeling and throwing out beer cans and doing stupid stuff like that to damage property, but you're just, you know, hiking respectfully and a nature lover. They say, sure, go right ahead. I had one lady, she was like, offer me some water, let me park in her driveway. That type of like kindness I found in Vermont from neighbors and people when I got permission was just really endearing. You know, I only got shot at like 10, no, 12 times, that's it. And they missed, you know, so it wasn't a big deal. No, I haven't been shot at, but you know, everyone, you know, most people are very nice and, and you know, I always respect private property. I want to set a good examples for, for hikers. Uh, so sometimes there were private property. I was able to find a way where there wasn't private property. So if on the south, it's posted. On the north, it may not be posted, and I could access it that way. Or generous landowners would give me permission. I want to set a good example for hiking uh, and, uh, you know, and, and be a good steward of the forest and outdoors. And people were really cool. So I didn't really have, you know, much of a problem, um, you know, at, at all with that. And I was, I was grateful. Another thing... Um, I thought I had a slide. Uh, I had a slide for uh, Lewis, Vermont, uh, but uh, Lewis, Vermont is really interesting. Uh, that's one of the towns where um, you could be like eaten by a mastodon. I mean, it's like there's <laughs> nobody lives there. Like literally, if you look up on Wikipedia, it will say I believe it says zero people in Lewis, and it's it's so that's the most remote part of Vermont, Lewis, Vermont. There's tons of mountains that are absolutely beautiful. And uh, that was another area that felt really special because it was just so pristine and so remote. Lewis, Vermont, way up in the Northeast Kingdom, one of the four unincorporated towns. Again, I think we're really lucky that two of them are down in our neck of the woods down here. I think that's pretty neat. Huh. What was this? This was Woodbury Mountain. So Woodbury Mountain, like I get to the top, this is in Woodbury, Vermont. It's like a 2,500 or so foot mountain. And there's all these like, random like road signs that somebody had to like haul up there because there's no there's you know there's there's no trail so somebody like went through the trouble to like and you'd find these unusual things i was like what so i slowed down right <laughs> here here this was state line ridge now state line ridge is not on the vermont 500 highest list but it was interesting this is on the border this is a mountain on the border between new york and vermont and i found this decrepit old stonehenge type monument that said 1882 on it, which I thought was just really unique. And that was part of the allure and the fun of hiking the Vermont 500 highest, is you would do it and you find these anomalies, these unusual things in the middle of nowhere that most, if not ever, you know, people had never seen before, uh, very few. And that was always interesting. What are you gonna find, you know? Um, here's a barred owl. Owls are my all time favorite animal. Like uh, I, lo I love owls and this was not on the uh, Vermont 500 highest mountain, but it was on a damn good mountain, which is Putney Mountain. How many people know about Putney Mountain? <laughs> Putney Mountain Association, the Putney Trails, some of the best ever. And we're so fortunate to have that right in our community. It's 
Every trail is awesome in Putney Mountain. Uh, the Westminster, it follows up, Pinnacle Association, that whole ridge line is very special to me. I've hiked there a ton, and there's trails um, for all different levels up there, and this was an owl I saw in Putney Mountain. Really special place, one of my favorite places on earth, and I thought I'd share that with you. Thank you. So, Fred Flintstone might have been here, but I don't think so, because this was, oh yeah, this was in Lewis. I knew I had a Lewis slide. So. Back to Lewis, this was in Lewis, never been quarried, never, no, there's no quarry, there was no activity. This was just like this sheared rock at like a perfect 90 degree angle. And I marveled, I was like, huh, how, that's great. I mean, it was very long too, and at this like perfect edge. And I said to myself, wow, that's amazing that that uh, could just have fractured like that. Again, it just, you know, uh, it was just fascinating to see. Uh, this is another interesting one. This was in Guidal, Vermont, the way up in the Northeast Kingdom near Victory. And this was the top of a mountain uh, that has no name. And the summit was demarcated by this boulder that's like bigger than a size of a city bus. I mean, it's an enormous boulder that was fractured perfectly in half. And it was just really unique. I was like, no trail, just in the middle of nowhere. And you had this massive, I'm not sure if it's a technically a great glacial erratic, but it was a uh, uh, very interesting, and I just, I was like, wow, that's so cool just to encounter these unique things while on this journey climbing these mountains. Oh, wow. This is a skull I found on Hoosick Mountain, which is in Reedsboro, down a little bit north of the uh, uh, Massachusetts state line. Yeah. Ho uh, Hoosick Mountain, beautiful mountain, and I, right near the summit, I found this skull, and I said, oh man, I look so much better with the skull in front of my face. I just carry myself around like that, like for the next like two couple of years. And I thought it was so neat, just like uh, finding something like that right at the top. And it was all, you know, still put together and everything. I was like, wow. So this was in Barton, Vermont, in the middle of nowhere. And you just had this maple tree with this ancient bucket. And what I thought was cool about this picture, I just encountered this. Wow. Sometimes you see these old, you know, metal and old, old farm things in the woods in the middle of nowhere. And this bucket had grown into the tree. But I think there's a different story here. I think the tree wanted to drink some of its own syrup. Because that's what it looks like. The tree's like, give me a drink. Come on. The tree's like, oh, oh. You know, and that's what I think it's doing. You know, the tree's just like trying to like drink its own syrup. It's like, save some for me. You're always taking it from me. Come on. And like, that's sort of what it looks like. The, the tree's trying to gulp its own sap. And I just thought that was so neat. And that was in Barton, Vermont. All right, so this is the audience participation part of, because I can't figure it out. Matter of fact, I, the whole reason I agreed to do this is because I'm trying to figure out the answer to this. I said, what can I, I'll, this will give me the chance to go in front of an audience so I can get some feedback from some, from some people who know more than I do about how this could have occurred because I don't. So I was like, okay, Lauren, I'll do it because I got to figure this out. So I'm in the middle of absolutely nowhere. So nobody actually did this. And that's about the size of a tire. And I was really hungry at that point, so I was hoping it was like a frosted donut. I was like, oh, I'll just eat the donut. But it's not top of the hook, but I eat that frosted donut. But it was, it was a snow donut. And so it just had rolled off of here, this big thing into a perfect like donut, like, but with an empty, you know, core. And I was like, and I obviously rolled down from there. I, I get that, but does anyone have any idea how that could have happened? Because that, that's all the only thing we're here to figure out. <laughs> Seriously, does anyone, any, anybody? What's that Ferris wheel like? Anyone? Anyone? Chinese satellite. Yeah, Chinese satellite. I don't know how, you know, the only thing I can think of is that maybe there was like an ice ball up on the cliff, like, you know, an ice, and, and it rolled with the wet snow, and then the ice popped out and, and left the donut that I couldn't eat. And, and it's just, what was that? It's such an anomaly. Again, that's not small. That's like a two-foot round thing, you know, with a hollow center. What? Wind? Wind. Yeah. <laughs> so the wind? And then, and then how, does it get the, the, how does it get the middle out, though? I think it's the force of the... I mean, I'm guessing with you, it, it could be an ice ball, but I wonder if it's wind and a, car, a wind current went in, and oh. the, the force of the wind pushed, pushed the snow out. Yeah, like sort of a vortex kind of force that the wind goes in and it rolls. Yeah. Somebody left the toilet. <laughs> I know it does. Space laser. It's a bagel. Mom, cover your eyes. So, not Vermont, but 
an awesome picture. This is Tumble Down Mountain in yeah. Maine. And it just looks like photoshopped, you know? It's like surreal, like you're looking back and just this ledge there. And I said, I gotta go out and get a, have someone take a picture of that because that was just so cool on Tumble Down Mountain. Where uh, up in, in what? Where in Maine? Uh, Tumble Down is, uh, bu -bu 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 well. what? Weld. Uh, over, Wells. Weld. Okay. Uh, Weld? Yeah, it's not far from uh, Rumney, I don't think. But yeah, like, uh, yeah, so yeah, because there's two tumble down mountains in yeah. Maine. Uh, but uh, one of them doesn't have a trail, an official trail. Uh, and so that's how you know it's this one. But yeah, this is tumble down mountain in Maine. And it's just like so beautiful uh, to go out there. Like, I just thought it was a neat, neat photo. Um, and then there it is. That was the 500th mountain I finished early this summer. 2022, early last summer, I finished on East Round Mountain in Avery's Gore, Vermont. Again, way out where the buses don't run. Very beautiful, remote area in the north, uh, northern part of the state. And uh, that was the 500 highest mountain. It took a few years to do them, but it was, it was just a, a really rewarding experience to, to, to explore. I love Vermont so much, and I just feel like we're so lucky to live in this area. Like... Uh, uh, and, and for those who live in Vermont, so fortunate to be in such a naturally beautiful place. And that's why I encourage people, it's like, you know, again, there can be a time and a place, Instagram and TikTok or whatever else is out, you know, it's like, it's like, but like, shut that off at times and get out there and don't let life pass you by because the outside and breathing in the air and see, and exploring in Vermont in the Northeast is so rejuvenating it's so like just absolutely fulfilling and that's what this adventure was and and uh the scenery the things i encountered you know i i uh i just won't ever forget it and it was absolutely really special and so that's just my big message tonight is to you know leave cyberspace remember to leave cyberspace and get outside and the other thing is definitely don't need to do what I, you know, like, like, however you get outside, that's cool. Like paddling, like biking, uh, you know, hiking on trails, whatever it is, doesn't matter. Just getting outdoors and however you recreate, that's freaking awesome. That's what is, it's about and just getting out there in the way that feels great to you. That's all I encourage, getting outside and seeing all that so much that has to offer in this area. And, you know, I just, I just want to thank, you know, the Green Mountain Club so much. I want to thank Lorne. I want to thank uh, Brooks Memorial Library. I want to thank them for doing this. And I, I really appreciate you all also coming out and everything. I'm, I want to answer some questions. I, I saved 15 minutes at the end, you know, to uh, answer questions. But first, you know, give, give a hand for Lorne, the Green Mountain Club, and Brooks here. I really appreciate it. So like I can do, so I can do, here's the things I can do. I do magic, I do relationship <laughs> advice, minimal astrology, horoscopes. I can do uh, cooking sometimes. Uh, uh, so French cuisine. So anything you want to ask me, go ahead and, and I'll, I'll try to give it my best shot. And that's what I encourage, you know, any questions you all have. So yes, right there. So other than King Green Man, that guy who you first met. Oh boy, dear God. <laughs> Speaking of cyberspace, hi, mom. Uh, did it, you ever talk with anybody else who does tracking or bushwhacking or stuff like that? Have you encountered other creatures like us? Oh yeah, there's there, there, there's a uh, yeah there's there's a few you know and there's and there's people yeah there's a few people who are just as extreme and do it all the time as as me uh, and um, there we've connected and. Um, that we're doing this thing where like once a year there'd be this thing called whack fest where like all the hardcore bushwhackers would go and just like camp in the forest and bushwhack uh, different mounds and I, I also want to clarify something for for those who uh, this is important because one person didn't understand this the word bushwhack is just a term for off-trail traveling you don't actually you definitely don't cut anything or like hurt anything like that goes against all the principles so it's called bushwhacking but it just means off-trail travel where there's no formal trail. It doesn't mean you actually, you definitely do not uh, you know, harm anything or cut anything. That's totally antithetical to 
our hiking values. So it's called bushwhack. I just wanted to define that for those who may not know. And yes, there are about 15 of us who are like, yeah, way off the deep end. Uh, <laughs> Spencer, Spencer, I would like, yeah. I'd oh. like to point out that Steve Smith, the famous writer, says bushwhacking does not mean you whack bushes, it means the bushes whack you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. With scars to prove it. Yes? Um, can you talk about what it was like to learn how to use a mapping compass, and did you have any interesting experiences? That's a great question. Uh, yeah, I was lost all the time and screwed up. <laughs> um, you know, so I wear a bow tie to work every day, and when I first started working, aka going on listen to John and Pete Beggar, when I first started working, I, I uh, uh, had to wear a bow tie, and like trying to tie the bow tie, it would take me, I'd have to like get up at like, in like the middle of the night to start working on tying my tie because it took, I couldn't figure out, you know, it took forever. And that's the way the map and compass was, like the first bunch of times, it's like, it doesn't go so well, but the more you do it, now I can tie my tie, like, you know, while putting like a ship in a bottle in context, <laughs> you know? So I can tie my bow tie now with like no, you know, because I've done it so much and that's the way I map a compass is just time on task, practice. And, and so I did all 110 mountains in Vermont with just a map and compass. And then after that, I said, all right, heck with this. I proved what I needed to prove. I can use a map and compass. Now I do use GPS because uh, that can mean the, it, it, GPS, somebody might argue, it, it's generally always going to be quicker. And, and when you're driving such long distances, I want to try to complete what I set out to do if I can. And so if I can go a little bit quicker, I definitely do use GPS. I always have backup map and compass. I, I have like three compasses with me that I carry. So it was... It, it, I definitely take some tutorials. I mean, it's good. you know, and again, this is a good thing about, you know, cyberspace is like YouTube. I mean, you can learn how to do like brain surgery on YouTube. Right. Uh, like I changed my dryer belt learning from a YouTube tutorial and was able to like take apart and do that. I mean, you can learn all kinds of stuff and same with Map and Compass. You can learn some tutorials on various internet channels and stuff like that. And I recommend that, but just practicing with it is what helps. So after I did, you know, 110 with Map and Compass, I, I, I did get good at it. But just like the boat time, but at first, not so much. Hmm. Yes. On the McDonald uh, Mountain. Yeah. How long? When you said you were going the pace of an ant, how long? How long was that hike? Was that a hike one that you completed? Yeah. Oh, yeah. That. Yeah, I completed that, and that takes like you know all out daylight hours of the day. I mean, there's there's going to be climbs that take over twelve hours. Summit and yeah, to do it, yeah, to, to bushwhack, it's gonna take, you know, the longest day I've ever had is 17 hours. That was the longest day I ever had. I started at four o'clock in the morning and got done at nine o'clock at night. Do you have an equation? I, I mean, I, my guess is it's different for bushwhacking than it is for mountain climbing. Um, but do you have an equation for mileage to time? Generally, and I think Roy will, bushwhacking is because, you know, so if you have a mile of trail, like a mile of bushwhacking is gonna feel like two to three, depending on how thick it is, two to three, double or more. You know, sometimes the forest is really open and it's no different than a trail, but sometimes the forest closes in, it gets right. such thick boreal forest that, yeah, it, it, you know, it can be, you're going like a quarter of a mile an hour or less, I mean, it, so it really depends. But the higher up you go, it tends to get thicker. Yeah, um, uh, yeah absolutely, so McDonald, uh, took a very long time, and, and you know, you're gonna hate this, but my, my wife did it with me. She's a good climber in her own right. She did the hardest mountain of the entire 770, and uh, that was just awesome, and we went out all day, and so, give my wife a hand for doing the job. I agree. Yeah. I agree with anyone who's done that. That was, that was, that was a tough one. one. One hike, one hike, it was so long. Uh, my wife, it, it went like so long. She fell asleep on like a jagged rock. So that was, it was 15 and a half hours in the Catskills. And, and we were going down Peekamoose Mountain. And there was just, and it wasn't like a nice, like Teflon, Italian marble, flat, smooth rock. It was like this horrible jagged, like not a nice rock. And she just like kind of collapsed on the rock. And I like tied my shoe or something. I turned around and she was like, just down for, I was like, are you alive? You know, she was like just down for the couch. She fell asleep on, and so, yeah, it's been some long days, you know? <laughs> do you hike alone, or do you always hike with someone? Or I should hike with someone. Uh, that would be safer. The problem is, most people have common sense, and so they don't want to go. And 
uh, you know, and so there's only, you know, when I can get people, yeah, I do, but that's why I take, a, I, I often hike alone, and I take a huge amount of steps. I always say, don't skimp on carrying stuff, because you, you, your inclination is like, oh, I want to travel light. I don't want to carry this stuff, but no, carry it. Carry the stuff, you'll be glad you have it. I bring a huge amount when I'm alone. Uh, not as much in the summer, if I'm not going to freeze to death, but, but definitely at different times of year, you, you have to. I bring a huge amount of stuff. I don't want to be like that movie, 127 Hours, where the dude doesn't tell anyone where he's going, yeah. and then he has to cut his own arm off to survive as a true story, uh, because he didn't tell anyone, where, nobody knew where he was. You tell people where you're going, and I carry, I carry the weight. I, I do, because to try to be safe. And I do try to go with people, but I'm not going to, you know, generally, you know, I want to be safe, but generally I'm not going to not go because I can't get something, because that'd be a lot of not going. And so I want to go, but I just bring extra safety gear. Let's see, I think we had you. Oh, yeah. Could you say, uh, could you go into what you actually put in the bag? And how many of your trips do you, do you intend to stay overnight so that it's multiple days versus up and down? And then what's your, what's all the secret stuff in your backpack? I'm, I'm going to have to, because we have a time limit, I'm going to have to go pretty quick on that, like, because there's a lot of stuff. So I bring two lighter, and this is not an exhaustive list. I don't want to be like, oh, well, they said at the thing, this is all I need. No, this is just some of the things I bring. I bring two lighters. I bring a newspaper. I bring fire starter sticks. Uh, I have two bivouac uh, outdoor uh, heat reflective sleeping bags that are really good uh, that I bring. Uh, I bring zip ties. I bring uh, three compasses. I have a satellite phone that can text two-way anywhere in the world and ping your location. Plus, I have my cell phone. Um, I bring a headlamp, a strong headlamp with a, a full, fully charged backup. I bring a, a knife, a mini saw, uh, and then extra clothes, especially in the winter, then I bring all kinds of extra jackets, clothes, extra gloves. And so, yeah, it ends up being a lot of stuff, but I put in compression sacks. So I get the compression sacks, and I can get it down so it's not as bulky. It does feel like you're carrying a few bricks around, but hey, the, you know, um, I'd rather carry it than not. It's I'm definitely always, you know, try it. So that's just some of the stuff I bring. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I want to know your, if you have a foolproof deer tick uh, repellent, like what do you do for that? Um, this is like the most unscientific theory yet. Yeah. yeah. Like, I like, I don't know what the deal is. Like, because I should have gotten Lyme disease like 5,000 yeah. times by yeah. now. And as far as I know, I've never had it. Yeah. And I don't know why, because like, I, you, you should take precautions for Lyme disease. And I've get, gotten zillions of ticks on me, and I, I check very thoroughly. Yeah. And I'm always wearing long sleeves, bushwhacking and stuff. And, and I, I, I think what... I don't know. I don't, I don't know what it is. I think maybe I get poison ivy really easy. I, I mean, I'm going to get poison ivy now just because I said poison ivy. Like, I get poison ivy just by like, thinking about it. And I have to get, you know, I get it so often and so easily. And maybe the universe just was like, all right, we'll cut him a break on Lyme disease since he gets poison ivy. <laughs> but it's very important because the ticks are, are, are real. Do you use anything or you don't? No. I, I should, uh, but I don't. I, I check myself very carefully afterwards, okay. uh, and, but and I haven't had a problem. But you do get a lot of them on you, yeah. uh, and I just check very, very carefully. You just find them and pull them off. Yeah, I pull, I pull them off, and yeah. usually, if you when I check early enough, I, you know, get them off before they're embedded or anything. Right. So I check very, very carefully, and I, I, yeah, it's like I definitely should, you know, do better in that department. Yeah, but it works. Right? Yeah. So, but yeah. now I'm gonna get poisoned. Yeah. yeah. Um, are any of the 500 peaks close to Brattleboro, and have you bushwhacked locally uh, any place you like around here? I think around here is awesome. Like there's so there's so many uh, nice places. One, um, uh, as you go out towards Wilmington and whatnot, mm. you know, uh, Mount Olga, Hogback Mountain yeah. is on the 500 highest list. Of course, Haystack and Mount Snow are. And then where there's a lot of them is in the National Forest by Rice Hill in Dover. Uh, that's not far from here. So like Rice Hill, and then there's some subsidiary peaks of Rice Hill um, uh, by, um, uh, by White's Hill uh, uh, in that area. And Rice Hill is... 2,900 and some feet, it's almost a 3,000 footer. So yes, uh, I really like that area that is uh, between uh, uh, going out the west part of Newfane 
and in Dover there, up on the hill, by you know, kind of in the Cooper Hill area. There's a bunch of peaks out there that are awesome and are bushwhacked. Yes? Just a factual question. Of the 770 over 3,000, uh, we know 110 are in Vermont. Uh, do you have the numbers, how many there are in New Hampshire, Maine, and New York? Yes, I do. Okay, so, so for, <clears throat> so for the seven, uh, uh, okay, so there's uh, 167 uh, in Maine. Uh, New Hampshire has 176. Uh, the, Cat, uh, the, the Adirondacks, there are 217, although sometimes people argue that there's five other ones because there's debates over the contour lines uh, uh, and the heights. So some, a lot of people think there's 222. So I did the extra five anyway. And so, <laughs> and so yeah, and then it was like 98 in the Catskills, uh, 98 in the Catskills. Did I get the, uh, Roy, I think I was pretty close there, right? Well, the problem is every time you come out with a new set of maps, the numbers change. I mean, I remember when there was 185 in New Hampshire, but then some of them lost calls on them. Yeah. Yeah, with LIDAR coming out, sometimes there's debate over the technical, but roughly that's, that's what it is, you know, so uh, within uh, the uh, Northeast. And then there's also four in, in Pennsylvania. Um, so I did drive way down to Pennsylvania and that was weird because there's like all this livestock. There was like a, a remarkable amount of livestock and I was just like, I'd be like cows and stuff like, like, and I'd, I'd be like, keep my distance and everything. It was like, but Pennsylvania was, it was beautiful, but yeah, there's four in Pennsylvania as well. Oh. Cause they count that. And you just lost out because they discovered by LIDAR that one of the summits is in the wrong place. Oh, really? Yeah, the state high point. Not oh, Mount Davis, yeah. Yeah, so LIDAR, you know, the, 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 the technology for measuring mountains a little more uh, uh, closely uh, has maybe changed some of it. But that's the general gist of what it is. So sometimes these lists evolve a little bit. All right, I think we've got time for uh, one more question. All right. Um, was it a nightmare? Did you carry your skis to the top of all of them? <laughs> I was just oh, when I when I ski, yeah. Now that is a nightmare because because when I when I carry my skis to the top of the 110, um, so uh, I have them strapped to my back. So I have uh, Randonnée Alpine touring skis that are extremely light, which was good. But I strapped them to, to my back, which which essentially creates like this antenna above me, which was so all of a sudden it's like ping, 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 ping. I'm like hitting branches and of course they're covered in snow. So everywhere I go, like going up these mountains, I'm getting whitewashed, car washed constantly, just like covered, like, you know, like that powdered sugar donut and like all the snow coming down on me. And that was a constant annoyance. Like my skis could, and I bought the shortest skis I could too. And still they would like stick up and there was like no good way to do it. And so you could say, oh, you could skin up, but you know, you can't skin up most of these that don't, don't have a trail. So that was, yeah, that was like, um, that was really grueling, yeah, for sure. So again, please uh, thank you to Lauren, thank you to uh, Brooks Library, and, and most of all, I really appreciate you all coming out. Like uh, Vermont and, and the Northeast is such a beautiful area, and I'm glad you could come to uh, hear all about it, and I hope that inspires you to just go out even more, and, and thank you so much, I really appreciate it.